Welcome everybody to the second robot simulations video using the Isaac Sim in NVIDIA's Omniverse. In this video, I'll share my experiences with attempting to use various algorithms to train the Biddle robot dog to walk. While this stampede of Biddles that you're seeing now is indeed a reinforcement learning algorithm that finally worked, getting here was mostly a journey of this. And this. This, 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 and this. What's going on is I'm attempting to have a machine learning algorithm learn to move the Biddle robot forward. This forward movement can be referred to as a forward gate. In many quadruped robots, this movement, the gate, is actually hand-coded, such as the forward gate of the actual Biddle robot. But what I want to do is see if I can use machine learning to learn a gate. As much as media or even tutorials like to demonstrate machine learning as a thing where you just simply import deep learning and everything just works out of the box, this is very far from reality. So how do I actually approach a problem like this where there isn't already some super clear answer or the problem isn't very simple? Simplify the problem itself. To start, let's cut the number of servos in half and use an environment that's much quicker to iterate with by using the bipedal walker environment from the OpenAI gym. This environment is similar to the one that we want to solve, where the objective is to walk forward without falling by controlling servos. And the servo positions are continuous rather than categorical. And what do we mean here? Take an environment like cart pull, where the goal is to balance the pull on the cart by moving the cart left or right. Here, the cart is merely moved with actions of 0 or 1, which correspond to left or right. Leg servos, however, are in a range of something like negative 1 to positive 1, for example. So rather than just two choices of left or right, we have theoretically infinite choices of servo positions between negative 1 and positive 1. Because of this, this is a substantially different problem than the typical deep Q learning, where the output is a probability distribution of some categorical actions. And what we want instead as the output is individual continuous values for each of the servos with the obvious intention that they will all work in unison to get the robot dog to walk. Now, I'm pretty weak in the area of reinforcement learning, and I've never run an algorithm with continuous output for reinforcement learning. So I poked around for various control algorithms for specifically continuous control, and I found DDPG or Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, an actor-critic-style algorithm for reinforcement learning with continuous control problems. Okay, so that covers our outputs, but what about our inputs? While we obviously need a model that can output what we want, the input to the model is of some importance too, I'd say. So what inputs do we actually require for an agent to learn to walk? The bipedal walker has LIDAR, ground contact senses, motor position and velocity, as well as hole angle and velocity. That's a lot of information, some of which on the physical biddle we just simply don't have, like LIDAR or ground contact sensing. And our version of hole angle is similar, but it's different. Can we still learn to walk without those luxuries? With deep reinforcement learning, answering questions like these can take time. Especially when it comes to, well, what combination of sensory information do we absolutely need? If tests take hours or days or more, this can be a real problem. Enter the lovely NEAT, or Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies, algorithm. I've grown to really love the NEAT algorithm as a proof of concept. If you missed it, I did a video on the NEAT algorithm a bit ago, and it's worth checking out for pretty much anybody, because you don't need a fancy GPU to use it. The beauty of NEAT is how extremely fast it can learn things. From my experience with NEAT, if NEAT can learn something, so if something's really complicated, like these very large language models, NEAT would never learn something like that. But if, if it's a problem that's simple enough that NEAT can learn it, it will usually learn it within a few minutes to a few hours at most. And then, if NEAT does actually learn something, this is basically a guarantee that a more traditional gradient descent deep learning algorithm can also learn it and probably do it much better. It might take a whole lot longer, but at least you will embark on that journey of time having a pretty good reason to believe that something can be learned here. 
To put this in perspective, let's compare the training and running of the NEAT algorithm and DDPG on the bipedal walker. What you see now is a slightly sped up 90 seconds of training the NEAT algorithm. <laughs> so what did we learn in those 90 seconds? Well, this isn't the most graceful walking we've ever seen. It's definitely walking. And what if we trained for an extra 30 seconds? Again, still not the smoothest walking we've ever seen, but it is very stable and it's pretty much solved the environment. And this took two minutes. Now let's compare that to DDPG. Here we have a 45 minute training session where we're showing the exploit only agent every 10 episodes. So we can actually see visually the walker definitely improves to a maximum that is both slightly better in terms of score than the two minute need algorithm, as well as it just visually looks better, more like it's actually running. But then the DDPG algorithm loses everything and gets silly again and never seems to recover. Apparently this is fairly common behavior for the DDPG algorithm to reach a peak and then lose it. But by this point, I have enough information to at least start taking some swings with the Isaac Sim and Biddle rather than continuing to play around and figure out this environment instead. Around this time, I got a care package from Puget equipped with two RTX 3090s, a terabyte in RAM, and a 32 core 64 thread beast of a CPU from Intel. I know right at this instant, you might be wondering what in the heck would we possibly use all that RAM for? Well, for now, not all that much. Our input observations are very basic features, but eventually we may want to include video input as well since the actual physical biddle does have an option for a camera on the front. And with that, pretty much all of these reinforcement learning algorithms use what's called memory, and that memory contains observations, among other things. The standard size of that memory is one million observations. So if we have one million images in there, or even one million groups of images, we need a ton of memory. Other than that, the Puget machine has enabled some extremely fast speedups in my training, both in running the actual simulator as well as training the model. The RTX 3090 cards are freaking awesome for machine learning. So for initial results, we have a whole lot of nothing for a DDPG. I actually never once got anything truly usable from DDPG. Now, this is pretty indicative of realistic deep learning, where if there's not already some sort of pre-made solution, it can often take quite a while before you get anything that starts to work, uh, and it's just a lot of trial and error. So initially, both algorithms, both DDPG and the NEAT algorithm, did a whole lot of this like jittery sliding stuff. This signals to me that there's certainly some physics tweaking that we're going to have to figure out in the future, and this really just seems to me more like the agent has learned to exploit the environment. Um, so possibly this is something to address in the future, but I also went ahead and just wrote a failsafe to stop this from happening. So if joints uh, on the whole, if more than like five joints, for example, don't move enough, then the reward is negative one, regardless of what actually happens in the sim. So it's sort of a punishment for this like jittery slide thing that it's doing. <laughs> And then in general, I'm rewarding Biddles for forward movement only, minus any side-to-side -side movement. And I'm doing this reward relatively per step. Beyond the slide hack, I also had variations learn things like jumping, or even cooler, this sort of short-term jump and roll thing. Uh, the problem here is this produced very short-term gains and reward, but then the model could never recover from learning that behavior. The first semi-successful algorithm finally worked, and unsurprisingly, it was the NEAT algorithm. There's definitely something very curious about how the NEAT algorithm continues to come up with these very silly looking gates, but they work. The best of the DDPG algorithm was here, which is obviously quite terrible and far worse than the NEAT algorithm and a little too slidey for my tastes. Now, that neat algorithm example is interesting, especially the way it like swings one of the legs around for the distribution of, of weight. Uh, and I'm totally tempted to put that on the physical biddle, but I want to approach that problem when I have something else to test as well besides that one, because something tells me that that won't go well, but it would be funny to see it on the actual physical biddle. And if it did work, that just, it would just be really cool to see. But we still need a solution that is better than arguably both of these. So then I turned my sights to TD3, an evolved version of DDPG, but didn't see any initial gains there either. And at this point, I'm starting to lose hope. Like, 
Maybe I'm not using valuable enough inputs. Maybe there's a bug in my code, but I'm confused by this because the neat algorithm did actually learn. Was that a fluke? Did I just get lucky? Right now, I'm only using servo positions along with rotational position deltas from the starting position, and I'm starting to wonder if possibly I'm misunderstanding the pose.r method in the Isaac sim. Like all intelligent deep learning researchers at this point, I began the shotgun approach. <laughs> I'll spare you the many different models that I tried, but then finally, something I tried actually worked. I increased the model size and the number of layers, and finally a model bit, at least for a little while. Now the default is not a small model, and I just kind of thought that the default size was a pretty good size. If anything, I felt like hmm, we could probably make a smaller model work. But regardless, the larger model is indeed what worked, and at least for a little while it worked anyways. This is a the graph shape that I've been seeing very frequently of reward uh, from a, a model in training of the DDPG variant. There's this bump in learning, things are going really well, and then the model just loses it all. I've attempted to change hyperparameters for the actual networks and the update rates, noise, all kinds of things. I've, I've tried everything. <laughs> And uh, I've even tried taking a model at that high peak and then changing some of the hyperparameters, like the update rate, for example, just so hopefully it wouldn't update itself back to stupidity, but that has not helped. So the current best result that I've seen is by leaving everything the same as it was in the original TD3 paper. The only significant change here is bumping the original actor and critic model sizes from being three layers of 400, then 300, 300 units to being four layers of 512 to three 256 unit layers. And just in case you want to grab the code and make changes yourself or apply this to one of your projects, the code that I was using was not my own. It was from the following GitHub repository, which has a bunch of examples of applying uh, TD3, TD3 and DDPG to, uh, in this case, PyBullet sim stuff, but basically OpenAI gem. Um, so you can use this code to apply this to pretty much any simulator uh, that kind of follows that, that structure Oh, that paradigm basically of, you know, getting an observation, taking a step action based on that observation, getting the reward and, and so on. So anyways, if you're interested in doing this sort of thing, whether it's in Isaac Sim or on some other environment, um, this is a pretty good place to start. There's lots of great examples and it's pretty easy to tweak and read the code from here. So anyway, can't recommend this one enough. The result of these changes is what you saw initially at the opening of the video. I've of course done some further tests to see if I can improve quickly from here by adding more layers or more units per layer. Nothing substantial yet, but this is definitely the new baseline that I will continue working from. So if you'd like to try to tackle this problem and maybe work from my baseline or make your own entirely, I've gone ahead and uploaded some files that I think might be useful to you. So um, I've, I've left a little bit of a list here, but I'll also go through everything uh, myself. So I've got the scene files that I'm using. Those should go inside of your Isaac directory in the nucleus. Uh, I've also got the best model so far. The trained model is up here uh, if you want to use that. And then also the, uh, the actual uh, uh, neural network model is also uploaded here as long as well as the original so if you want to work from the actual original uh, and try other things or you know come up with your own version that's totally fine and probably the big thing if you want to play it you can play it but it's just going to be the video that you saw essentially uh, and if you want to train it this is the training file here so we can kind of run through essentially this is just me hacking in the working uh the using the isaac sim in place of the open ai gym environment so it's kind of messy there might be some redundancy here there might even be errors here so uh, feel free to look through it submit prs if you think that there's something that can be improved or i'm doing something wrong uh, if you're just looking for something to do probably the first thing i would look at is right here pose.r part of me thinks that either this should be maybe relative pose.r or Maybe pose dot order isn't even what I think it is. <laughs> so, like, I'm not sure if it's in relation to the actual plane, and then each biddle has its own plane. Anyway, uh, that's a, a spot that someone could start with. But anyways, we've got some basic starting um, constants here. Whether or not we want to load a model, so we can train from that pre-trained model. If we, as long as we keep everything the same, um, 
like in, in terms of the model that we're going to train from and so on. Um, and then uh, we've got max steps. You can increase this or decrease this if you want. Uh, this here is for tracking that kind of wiggle. Basically, how we're just trying to make sure a standard deviation is high enough uh, in the movements. How many random episodes? Just how many episodes do we want to start with uh, where we're not really trying to use the agent's model at all? We're just randomly moving. Um, this would be another thing that you could try to tinker with, maybe do more random episodes. This is your memory buffer. One million is just the standard. I have tried to do three million, five million, uh, and then even smaller, like 500,000, nothing really seems to make a difference. Max total reward, I think this would be a redundant thing. I don't actually think it's even being used. Biddle count, you it, you might find that the biddles are stepping really, really slowly. So you might want to decrease this or increase this. I, the files that I have have 20 biddles, if I recall right. So you can use any number from 1 to 20. Coming down, uh, these are just some of the... Uh, things from the original TD3 script. You can change those if you want. Lots of lots of things to tweak here, like exploration noise, discount, tau, all this stuff. Like You could definitely tweak that. Um, these are just the hard-coded values. If you wind up having more of an observation, something else in the observation, you're going to want to add that because I've just hard-coded this. The action dimensions, this is just how many servos that we have. I don't think that's going to change at all, ever. Max action, this might actually be somewhat variable. I forget. I think it might even go up to like 1.3. It's like some some odd range, so I just went with 1.1. So that could be probably tweaked. Uh, let's see. Then we load in the model. We're just setting some information for the Isaac Sim here. Uh, and then we're just going to start iterating over the episodes themselves. Uh, if we're doing random, cool, we're doing random. Some more Isaac Sim stuff, we go ahead and start up the Isaac Sim. And then basically, this is just the initial whenever a scene gets set up. Making some dictionaries here. This is because we're running multiple biddles, but we're actually running a single, multiple biddles in a single environment. So the way that we're going to do this is for every step, we're going to iterate over every single biddle. But as we iterate over the biddles, the way that these things are architected is essentially you want to be able to get your observation, come up with your action, uh, and then all of the biddles need to take that action. So, so what I'm doing is iterating over all of the biddles here. We're actually taking the action, but then before we can train the model, we need to go ahead and step the environment. So kit.update is essentially that step. And then we're going to iterate over all of the biddles again, getting their reward essentially from this point. So I calculate the total reward based on the delta from their, car their, their starting position to their current, and then I'm subtracting any X. So any side to side movement, we're just subtracting that. And then in this case, I, to be honest, I already forgot that I even divided by 10 here, but apparently, <laughs> apparently I'm doing that. So anyway, you, you, can, you can use this and, and, and tweak from here. I have tried to not divide by 10 as well. Uh, like I said, I didn't even remember that that was in there, but that is what I used for the best performance so far. So anyway, um, you can try to tweak this, come up with your own different rewards. Maybe you want to scale rewards more like the, the bigger steps. Maybe you want those to be exponentially um, more rewarding or something. So you feel free to tweak the total reward. That's probably the most, or not the total reward necessarily, but the actual reward in this case will be the, uh, the delta from the previous, where was the biddle previously to where is it now? Um, that's kind of, that's the relative reward per step. So then coming down here, this is my fail safe, essentially. Uh, what I'm doing is making sure we have enough in that, that so we don't have like just one movement, but then we're gonna check the standard deviation of all of the movements. If that standard deviation is less than that movement for enough of the servos, in this case, more than, uh, well, five or more, uh, if that is the case, then we're going to say the reward is a negative one. We don't really care what that relative movement was. It's probably shaken around. So I've played with uh, 0.1 and then 0 0.05. Both of, somewhere in there is probably the best, but again, feel free to tinker with that. Maybe don't even use it at all, but I, I've tried that as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, so then we get the reward. And, uh, and then in this case, uh, let's see if there's anything else. So in this case, we're saving the previous total reward, but that's just so we can later do the uh, relative reward. Um, but here you can see the actual reward is what we set up here. So this is what actually gets added to the memory. I forget why I threw in an if true. Again, like I said, <laughs> this is all very hacked together. At some point, this probably was actually asking 
uh, if the Biddle, well, I used to, I was using Biddle zero as the constantly the exploit Biddle, and now I'm exploiting every 10 steps or something. So anyway, that's probably what was going on there. Anyways, um, and then after, um, after we've done an entire for each episode, so we've, we've stepped over um, every step, we've iterated over the Biddles, we've stepped the environment, we've iterated again over all of the Biddles, then we go ahead and actually train that policy. And again, here, this is um, how many iterations do we want to train for? What is our batch size? So the default batch size was 128. But then once we add more Biddles in the environment, in theory, we're kind of, uh, we're increasing the number of iterations considerably. So again, I've just kind of tweaked that and tinkered around trying to figure out what is the best way. Because in, in general, as long as you have enough data, which I think we do, um, you arguably you'd rather have a larger batch size. So anyways, I'm still tinkering with that as well. Um, printing out some just basic information as things are training, and then also saving either the exploit reward or the train reward over time, uh, which actually just reminds me, I don't have that graphing script. I don't think I uploaded that. Let me check that real quick. Plot results. Yeah, so I have a plot results version of my own. So I'll go ahead and upload that to, that too as well so you can uh, graph those at live as it trains. Anyway, that's all for now. Hopefully the next time you guys hear from me, I will have something even more impressive up to this point. Uh, if you guys want to issue fixes, PRs, whatever, or maybe you can come up with something even better than me, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I will see you all in another video.